Welcome to Pelvic Ultrasound. In performing pelvic ultrasound, we'll be using two types of scanning, transabdominal and transvaginal. Transabdominal scanning, the bladder should be full, we'll be obtaining long and transverse views of the organs of interest, and we'll use the curvilinear probe, which has a nice big footprint. The probe will be placed just above the pubic symphysis with the indicator towards the patient's head. On our screen, we'll be able to see the underlying organs, with the most anterior being the bladder, followed by the uterus, the cul-de-sac, and perhaps the rectum. In this ultrasound image, one can see a distended bladder. The probe is placed on the abdomen, and the top of the screen is where the probe is. So this is the anterior aspect of the patient. The area away from the probe placement is the posterior aspect of the patient. When we're doing a long axis view and the indicator is towards the patient's head, the indicator on our monitor will indicate the patient's head and the area away of the patient's feet. Again, you can see a triangular shape distended bladder with a underlying uterus just behind it and just a little bit of the cul-de-sac. This is another view, transabdominal longitudinal, indicator is towards the patient's head, probe is placed anteriorly, the top of the screen is anterior, bottom of the screen is posterior. The indicator is directed towards the patient's head and the area away is the feet. Here one can see a bladder, a bit less distended than our prior image, with the uterus, which is more prominent with a thickened endometrium. After obtaining a long axis view, will rotate the probe 90 degrees towards the patient's right, such that the indicator is now towards the patient's right. The ultrasound beam will now go into the patient and we'll see our structures in short axis. Again, the probe is placed on the abdomen. The top of the monitor is anterior. Away from the monitor is posterior. We see the bladder in short axis, now looking more square or rectangular. The indicator is towards the patient's right, so this aspect of the screen is the patient's right, and the area away from that would be the patient's left. Another image, this one with, where you cannot see the bladder because it, it is undistended, and instead one can see the uterus, which is this circular structure, fairly anterior in our image, and just behind it you're actually able to see the ovary with a small follicle. Again, the indicator is towards the patient's right, therefore this aspect of the screen is the right side of the patient, and the area away is the left side of the patient. Transvaginal scanning. With transvaginal scanning, you'd like to have a bladder that is empty. The probe needs to be prepared such that there is acoustic gel placed directly on the probe. A non-latex cover is then placed over it, with care to remove any air bubbles, and then additional gel or surgery lube is placed on top of the cover. We will be, we will be performing um, two planes of orientation, sagittal or long axis, and coronal or short axis. The probe will be placed in the vagina, ideally with the tip of the probe touching the anterior lip of the uh, cervix. The ultrasound beam will be admitted into the patient. And what one will expect to see is perhaps a small portion of a non-distended bladder, the uterus, the cul-de-sac, and the rectum. Now on our monitor, the monitor is oriented such that the probe is at the top of the screen. So our image is going to be rotated. The top of the screen is where the probe is placed. So this is the caudal end, as you can see with the picture. The area away from the probe will be the cephalad or towards the patient's head. The indicator is directed anteriorly or up such that the indicator on this monitor screen will be the patient's anterior aspect and the area away will be posterior. Here one can see the long axis or sagittal view of the uterus with a small amount of fluid in the cul-de-sac. This image, the uterus appears to be going in the opposite direction or backwards. It's not because of improper technique, it's because the patient has a retroflexed retroverted uterus. Once we've obtained our long axis view, we'll rotate our probe 90 degrees towards the patient's right. So now the indicator is rotated towards the right. Now again, the monitor is oriented such that the probe is at the top of the screen. 
And so our image will look as if the patient is flipped. The indicator is towards the patient's right. And when we look at our real-time image, what we'll see is the uterus in now a, a bit of a short axis view, or we'll call it coronal. In terms of orientation, the top of the screen is where the probe is placed. So this is the caudal end or aspect of the patient. The area away from the probe is cephalad. The indicator is now turned towards the patient's right side. So when we're doing a short axis or coronal view of the uterus, the indicator will be towards the patient's right. And the area on the opposite side of the screen will be the patient's left. After looking at the, at the uterus, we're going to angle a bit to the right and to the left, a little bit obliquely, trying to identify the ovaries, as well as any other adnexal masses. The ovaries can usually be identified as being just anterior and medial to the iliac vessels. This transvaginal image shows the iliac vessel with the right ovary just anterior and medial. The uterus is seen to the right of the screen. Looking in the left adenexa, one can see the left ovary, and towards the left side of the screen, you can see the uterus. First trimester sonography, normal intrauterine pregnancy. Early normal pregnancy, one of the first structures that will be seen is the gestational sac, which will be surrounded usually with some thickened endometrium, which is called the double deciduous sac sign. This is generally seen around four to five weeks estimated gestational age. This transvaginal sagittal image of the uterus demonstrates an intrauterine fluid collection, which is consistent with a gestational sac. This is a transabdominal view again with a just what looks like a gestational sac within the uterus with nice thickened endometrium which we'll call the double deciduous sac sign. Now while this is consistent with an early pregnancy, this is not a definitive image for an IUP because ectopic pregnancies can have similar findings. Ectopic pregnancies approximately 10% of the time can have what is called a pseudo gestational sac which will look just like a normal gestational sac. So it's not until we're able to see the yolk sac within the gestational sac within the uterus that we will say someone has a definitive IUP. The yolk sac is the first structure that we can see within the gestational sac. It is a small circular structure, very echogenic or bright, and it's seen around five weeks to 12 weeks estimated gestational age. This is a transvaginal image coronal image with an intrauterine gestational sac, with an intrauterine yolk sac, and a nice de double deciduous sac sign as well. In this clip, this is a transvaginal image with containing a intrauterine gestational sac and yolk sac, and actually a little fetal pole up at the um, top of the screen here, which I'll point out. The embryo is usually seen around five to six weeks, and very quickly well, you'll see cardiac activity around six, six and a half weeks, or once the fetal pole is five millimeters in length. In this transvaginal view, one can see an intrauterine gestational sac containing a yolk sac and a fetal pole. Another image with a little later in gestation containing a fetal pole and a yolk sac. This transabdominal view contains the fetal pole, which is being measured with a crown rump length to help determine in dating. Once you see the fetal pole, you should look for cardiac activity and then document this. And this is done by first doing B mode scanning so you can find your fetal pole, then using your M mode. Your M mode will allow you to select a small slice of ultrasound image to display over time. This small slice of ultrasound image, which is then displayed over time, will, will reveal this kind of undulating pattern where the cardiac activity can be measured. Your computer software on your ultrasound machine will 
um, allow you to calculate a heart rate by, by measuring anywhere from one to two to three cycles depending on the machine software. When you measure this, it will then come up with a heart rate that you can then document. In this case, the heart rate was 166. Corpus luteal cysts are very common, also called corpus luteum cysts. They're seen within the ovary. They're usually fairly simple in um, appearance, meaning they don't have internal echoes. They secrete progesterone early on in the pregnancy to support it. This is a corpus luteum cyst over in the left ovary with a small amount of free fluid, which is normal physiologic. So let's go over two cases. Case number one. 21-year-old G2P1001, last period six weeks ago, complaining of pain and bleeding. Her pregnancy test is positive. Her exam has a closed os. It's fairly non-tender with a scant amount of blood in the vault. Next step. I would start with transabdominal, even though it seems like it's pretty early in pregnancy, for two reasons. One, it gives you a better overall view to start with, kind of seeing the the forest before you zoom in on the trees, so to speak. And secondly, it helps ensure that the bladder is not distended, is empty when you do your transvaginal scanning. So I'll start with transabdominal and follow with transvaginal if needed. In this transvaginal scan, one can see a large irregular appearing gestational sac with a fetal pole which looks kind of slumped upon itself. As you look in the thorax, you don't see any clear cardiac activity. This is an early embryonic demise. Once you've seen that there's no cardiac activity and you've confirmed that it is large enough that you should expect to see it by doing a crown rump length, consultation with OB to discuss further management would be appropriate. Case 2. 22-year-old female coming in, campaigning of pain and bleeding. She states that she has been pregnant. She said she's actually had multiple visits with multiple scans and was diagnosed with a miscarriage, but she's still having significant pain. Her exam, she's very tender abdo um, on, trans on an abdominal exam, and her pregnancy test is negative. However, the clinician in this case sent a serum beta HCG, which came back at 12. Just barely positive. Transabdominal, uh, transvaginal, excuse me, ultrasound was done, showing an empty uterus surrounded by complex free fluid. I say complex because it has internal echoes. It's not just black. A look into the adnexa displays again complex free fluid and a adnexal mass that looks pretty consistent with perhaps a fetal polar yolk sac. This patient was taken to the operating room and was found to have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And yep, the beta was only 12. So this reminds you, if you don't have a documented IUP, meaning a patient has clear evidence of a yolk sac or fetal pole within the uterus, or documentation of clear products of conception on pathology after a miscarriage, when a patient comes in with either pain or bleeding, she has an ectopic until proven otherwise. And so oftentimes documentation when you see this patient will be patient has a pregnancy of undetermined location. Don't let the beta fool you that a beta is either too high or too low to either be an ectopic or not be an ectopic. Definitive ectopics are usually referred to as being definitive when you can see a clear yolk sac or fetal pole that is not in the uterus. Here is an example of an extra uterine yolk sac and fetal pole. The tubal ring sign is highly suspicious for ectopic pregnancy. This is a thick echogenic ring structure in the adnexa, seen here. Sometimes all that one sees is an adnexal mass, not anything definitive, but is still concerning and suspicious for an ectopic. And even in some cases, you may not see any adnexal mass at all. In this video clip, one can see that the uterus is empty, 
It has a thickened endometrium. And as you scan through into the anexa, you can see this mass, which appears to be a extra uterine gestational sac containing a yolk sac. This would be a definitive ectopic. Again, one word on the beta. The beta in the discriminatory zone is meant as a guide. It gives us the idea that if a person has a normal developing pregnancy, at approximately some discriminatory zone, most will use 1500, one would expect to see an intrauterine pregnancy. So we generally would expect someone to have an IUP that would be identifiable, meaning a yolk sac within the within the uterus around a beta of 1500 done via transvaginal sonography. However, a patient can have a beta that's either higher or lower than this and have an ectopic pregnancy. So this one time number of a beta is not particularly helpful in helping us determine what type of pregnancy a patient has. Following the betas is absolutely helpful. Seeing a natural doubling every, four, every 48 hours is helpful and, and makes it likely that the patient has an IUP. But unfortunately, there are some ectopics, usually early on, that can have a similar rise. Additionally, a dropping of the beta may support a miscarriage, but ectopics can also have a dropping of the beta HCG. So when you're evaluating a patient with a symptomatic first trimester, preg trimester pregnancy, it's important to use the beta as just one data point. You want to look at the patient, look at risk factors, look at physical exam, hemodynamic stability, ultrasound image, and the beta, and put it into one big clinical picture. Just a few uh, words on proper transvaginal probe storage and cleaning. Our probes are, are kept in a cabinet, either in the clean utility room in the main ED or over in the eye track area. The probes are located inside the cabinet. They will be taken out of the cabinet and placed inside this clear container for transport to the patient room. The probe is placed in the container. You go do your scan as you, as you should, and when you are finished, you will then wipe the probe clean. You will place the probe in a chuck into the plastic container with a patient sticker. You will then remove the green tab and reveal the dirty tab, which is red, on the top of the plastic container. You will then take this container into the soil utility room and place it in the main ED in this little hutch and let the tech know that a probe needs to be cleaned. In the eye track area, there is a table that we will show you where you place it. But again, you must find the tech and let them know that there is an ultrasound probe that needs to be cleaned. Thank you very much for your attention.